um, dear partners, dear panelists and guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this first event, this kickoff event of our online lecture series, European Strategic Dialogue. Um, my name is Iris Beatrice Müller, and I'm very happy to welcome you today on behalf of the four partnering organizations that brought this new initiative into being. Um, namely, the Institute of Security and Global Affairs at the University of Leiden in the Netherlands, directed by Professor Joachim Kurz, the Institut Français du Pays Bas, rep uh, represented by Monsieur Landry Charrier, the Center for Advanced Security, Strategic and Integration Studies at the University of Bonn in Germany, directed by Dr. Enrico Feld, and the Friedrich Naumann Foundation uh, for Freedom, which I am representing tonight. So what is the idea behind this new format backed um, by these four partners from Germany, France, and the Netherlands? Well, as we all know, Europe is facing an unprecedented security challenge or challenges that threaten our continent, its cohesion, its democracy, its values, its freedom um, from different directions. And these challenges call for an informed and effective policy making that needs common actions, especially by core European countries, um, which are France, Germany, and Netherlands um, in particular. And it is therefore, in our opinion, important to open up this digital platform, the European Strategic Dialogue, um, on which we discuss the different dimensions of key questions, thinkers from the three countries mentioned, and also others. Um, so this new series intends to bring together policymakers, academics, um, diplomats, think tankers, civil society representatives in order to analyze and discuss um, core future issues in European security and defense. Um, and each dialogue will explore one particular aspect related to this future. Um, and even though the focus of this series is placed on the Netherlands, France and Germany, and also on how they, well, they could potentially cooperate more closely on issues such as strategic autonomy, on border security uh, or hybrid threats, um, the format will also include European and global voices from beyond these three nations. Furthermore, we would um, like to include you as our audience um, with your questions and remarks. So please make use of this opportunity, join in um, our discussions um, via the chat box in which we invite you to post your questions and, and thoughts discuss with our panelists. For this kickoff, we are very happy to have two welcoming speeches tonight by two people who are both very busy and still took the time to join us today and I'm very honored to introduce both of them um, tonight. Our first speaker is His, Ex His Excellency Monsieur Louis Vassy, who has been um, serving as the French ambassador to the Netherlands since 2019. Ambassador Vassy's diplomatic career though began already in 2004 and he has held numerous positions within the French foreign ministry um, for example, he was responsible for French-Indian relations to nuclear non-proliferation. He also worked at the French Embassy in Washington, D.C. as first secretary and for different French ministries as cabinet director. Next to his position as ambassador to the Netherlands, His Excellency also represents the French Republic at the organization or the prohibition of chemical weapons. Welcome here with us tonight, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you for having me. Shall we start? Um, am, am, am I supposed to start now? Please go ahead. Okay, good. Uh, look, um, I thought a little bit of uh, what I could share maybe um, as, a, as an introduction and I, I want to keep it short, obviously. Um, maybe uh, working on the on the basis of my experience of the of the last few years um i don't want to repeat what you said but really uh, a big thank you a big thank you to all involved in uh, developing this uh, this program uh, in bonn in leiden uh, and also uh, at the at the institut francais and uh, if you allow me uh, a special uh, recognition to my dear dear friend uh, dirk brengelman with whom uh, as you might have uh, seen or as you know uh, we've uh, we've been able uh, to live up to the quality of the french german relation uh, in support of uh, of europe um, including uh, here in the hague in uh, in complicated times uh, during the pandemic and when uh, uh, one of the questions that we had to tackle was the level of uh, coordination we would uh, um, end up accepting as europeans uh, in terms of our uh, reforms and, and recovery package, uh, which a uh, process that, uh, as you know, ended up um, uh, being consensual. It wasn't completely obvious uh, in the beginning and, uh, and uh, led to the 
uh, structuration or ad adoption of, uh, of a very uh, ambitious uh, support package for the for the European economy. Um, I'm really glad that uh, you've decided uh, in this uh, three-way dialogue to um, tackle the specific uh, issue of um, strategic Europe. Um, as you as you know, and of course, um, uh, I'll go back to some of the concepts that, uh, that are at stake here, but as you know, one of the cornerstones of the vision we try as France to um, to promote at the European level is actually the necessity to um, have a Europe mm. that becomes uh, uh, explicitly and accepts the need to become more strategic. At the same time, when I thought of uh, what I could say uh, in this introduction, I, I, I figured out, I figured that maybe um, it could be useful, even though I'm not an academic, to try to go back to some of the concepts that we are using. Uh, also, because sometimes semantics matter, and uh, we 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 have this capacity as Europeans to disagree on semantics, even though actually the ideas that we are uh, looking at uh, are more often than not uh, um, pretty close. Um, and the, the the first maybe um, um, point I would like to make is about the the issue and the concept of strategy. So if you look at the definition of uh, strategy, um, the, 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 the shortest one in a way is a plan of action designed to achieve a long-term overall aim. And that means um, that we have a couple of questions when we look at uh, strategic issues uh, that need to be um, embraced. First of all, our ability to define collectively what the desirable, but also achievable aims are. I think that's in a way the, the work that we will need to be doing collectively um, when we work around the, the strategic compass that as you know, um, should be adopted uh, under the French uh, presidency of the EU. So do we agree on what we want to do collectively, uh, what our purpose as Europeans is? Second, I think, in, in, and in a, in a sense, this first layer is, is, is the easy one. Second, um, I would say uh, that a strategic mind understands that resources are uh, in essence limited. Um, let's say country X with uh, 5,000 inhabitants uh, has a long-term aim that is uh, world dominance, uh, it might actually discover that uh, the resources are not, uh, are not enough to meet uh, that, uh, that objective. So the question of resources needs to be uh, taken uh, into account. And then uh, I think it also, it's also fair to say that a, a strategic mind and what makes strategy in the international arena a bit specific compared, let's say, to um, uh, corporate strategy um, is that uh, you have also to take into account the fact that strategic minds also exist um, in other nations or groups of nations and they too have aim, aims and them too have resources. Um, and that in itself represents an additional constraint that you need to take into account when uh, looking at the best way, the optimal way to achieve your long-term uh, objectives. Um, in a sense, uh, these are um, concepts that for some for a long time, have not been have not been completely absent of um, uh, EU thinking, uh, but still uh, there present there in a minor mode. Um, I remember when we when I was at the foreign ministry um, and, and and I come came back, let's say, to the foreign ministry from the defense ministry in 2017. 
one of the things uh, in in one of the first speeches that uh, the, the the then new um, foreign minister did, um, uh, he introduced this idea that uh, there was a need for the European Union to understand better that uh, the, the the dialect the the language of uh, rapport de force. And there you see, I still do a little bit of semantics and I'm sorry for that. I find it extremely interesting that a rapport de force is actually um, a, a phrase, a set of words that you cannot really um, translate perfectly into English. Um, of course, you could say balance of power, but balance of power is static, whereas rapport de force actually introduces uh, uh, a notion of uh, dynamics in its uh, in its thinking, and I think relates back to the fact that you are in a very uh, fluid environment when you look at uh, strategic um, uh, actors. Um, but in a way, as Europeans, what can we do uh, once we've asked these questions of uh, what is desirable, what is uh, what our what our resources are? and uh, what the objectives of our competitors of our rivals uh, are. Um, on the aims, um, I think it's fair to say that we have an overall uh, agreement, I guess uh, we'll, we'll, in the strategic compass, we'll find things such as, of course, uh, ensuring the security of our citizens, uh, ensuring the security and stability at our, uh, at our borders, uh, certainly the promotion of uh, values-based international order, of a legal uh, international orders uh, based on norms, based on previsibility, um, these kind of concepts that the EU has crafted of, over the years for itself and uh, uh, would like or tries to um, uh, um, make sure become international standards, not so much because in, in the logics of uh, domination, frankly, but simply because they are the ones that will provide stability and progress uh, collectively. Um, and then, of course, priorities may differ. People, countries in the East will look at the East, countries in the South will look at the South. But overall, I think this set of long-term uh, priorities can be uh, can be shared and, and won't be that difficult to share, hopefully. Um, the second point is the necessity to understand what our resources are, and simply there I, I will be very quick, and, but, but I can only advise to people to um, uh, maybe look back at a speech our uh, foreign minister did in Strasbourg a couple of weeks ago on uh, October 19th. Uh, we have the largest market, we, have, uh, we are the largest provider of international aid, um, we are an industrial powerhouse. Look at the uh, at vaccines, for example. The fact that we become the, the main exporter uh, of uh, vaccines uh, worldwide. We have uh, large military capacities, and I would say we also have alliances, uh, and namely NATO, which uh, of course is one of the assets we have. Uh, friends and allies are one of the uh, resources uh, you hopefully can mobilize when uh, necessary. And then a uh, third point, but I won't be too long there. I think it's fair to say that we need also to factor in the fact that the conflicting aims are becoming uh, more and more uh, um, uh, stronger and stronger, more and more aggressive. Um, I won't quote all of our rivals, but uh, everyone sees them. We have uh, China, the rise of China as, a, as, a, as an, uh, an uh, huge economic power and what it means in terms of our economic relations with them. We have, of course, Russia, we have Turkey, and we have many uh, others. And unfortunately, an increasing number of actors, of, of actors who are, uh, in fact, in, interested in the collapse or the failure of the European Union, and uh, some of them uh, less traditional uh, than others. Um, then, uh, and, I, uh, and, and maybe that's uh, the call I would like to make, uh, being strategic is also a state of mind. Um, it's a question of your ability to understand uh, power dynamics in the international uh, uh, arena. 
There again, sorry to do a little bit of semantics, power has two translations in French, actually. Um, power can be pouvoir, which is a capacity and an ability to do, again, very static. Uh, and power uh, can be puissance. So, um, and there, again, you introduce uh, a kind of uh, uh, dynamism in the in the, con in the in the concepts, and that's why, by the way, when you when we we say Europe and power in French, we translate it not so much by uh, pouvoir européen, but by puissance européenne, because it's a way to relate to the rest of the world in a in a dynamic uh, in a dynamic way, and that has to do with what I said on, on the difference between rapport de force and balance of power. I think. Um, and then the first layer, uh, once you've understood that you are uh, looking at power dynamics, is um, to understand, uh, and that's where I think that semantics do not matter so much, to be honest, to be honest, that there is no strategy without autonomy or sovereignty. In a sense, we say strategic autonomy, but it's a bit obvious that to be strategic, you need to be autonomous. Um, if you are not autonomous, you simply don't have the ability to define uh, your long-term aims. And we've just said that it's in fact enshrined in the very definition of what being strategic is. And you are not autonomous to mobilize your resources if you are dependent uh, on external actors uh, to decide which resources you can mobilize. Um, it makes you a non-strategic actor because the strategy is actually defined elsewhere. And I think that's true in energy. It's true in defense. Uh, it's true when you talk, when you look at your market protection, and it's true, frankly, of uh, many uh, national security issues. Of course, it doesn't mean you shouldn't cooperate with others. It shouldn't even imply that you shouldn't that you shouldn't accept some degrees of interdependencies. But if you are dependent from other actors, and that it's not a balanced relation. Uh, then you are the one actually losing your autonomy to define your aims and your and, and the way to get there. And the point I think that we, I would like to make to conclude is is that one is that if we really believe that the European Union um, promotes a specific set of values, democracy, uh, rule of law, uh, equality, uh, whatever your origins or uh, uh, status is, uh, freedom of speech, freedom of thought. Um, if we think that is important, um, we we better realize that the only way to promote them at the international level, and frankly, to even protect them at home, is actually to be powerful and autonomous enough to make sure that we are not uh, imposed from the outside another vision of the international order. Um, I'm not saying that's the risk we run right now, but it's also true that we see uh, challenging challenges emerging in, at a very uh, at a very quick pace. And I would simply underline and finish maybe with that uh, reflection. Um, in uh, 1853, when uh, the the boats or the, of the uh, Commodore Perry uh, entered the uh, the Bay of Tokyo. Um, the Japanese realized that whatever their set of values was at the time, uh, including their belief in a very uh, autarkic system, their ability to sustain that was actually limited by their uh, weakness towards uh, compared to external actors. So the only way to actually sustain your uh, way of life or the, the values you believe in is actually your ability to be a strategic actor, which means deciding on your aims and mobilizing your own resources to get there. And sorry to have been a bit long, but that's the reflections I would like to, I wanted to share with you um, for this uh, uh, introduction. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency, for these welcoming remarks and the points you made um, and also your reflection on European strategic autonomy. Um, and now I'm proud to be able to present another welcoming address tonight um, from Professor Dr. Birgit Ulrike Münch, who is the Vice Rector of International Affairs at the University of Bonn. 
Um, Ms. Münch is Professor for the History of Art at Bonn University and her academic career is truly a European one. Um, her research focus is on the art of the Netherlands and she dedicated her um, habilitation thesis on alternative art forms in both the Netherlands and in France. Um, next to her um, position as Vice Rector of Bonn University, um, Professor Münch is also Vice Speaker of the Centre Ernst Robert Curtius, which is a research center on European cultures and a platform also for Franco-German dialogue projects at the University of Bonn. Welcome here tonight on our digital panel, Professor Dr. Münch. Thank you so much, um, dear Excellency Ambassador Louis Vassy, dear Ambassador Dirk Brengelmann, dear Evelyn Grenesch, um, dear Iris Müller, dear Professor Dr. Joachim Krups, dear Sophie Verité, and uh, dear Dr. Landry Charrier, um, and dear our leadership of the CASIS team. I mentioned the three directors, our Dean, um, Professor Dr. Volker Kronberg, Professor Dr. Wolfram Hiltz and Professor Dr. Ulrich Schlie, and of course here with us, the general manager, Dr. Enrico Fels. A survey conducted by the European Council on Foreign Relations in April 2021 shows that 55% of Germans now consider the European Union political system dysfunctional, an increase of 11 percentage points since April 2021. 20. 49% of Germans say they have less or much less trust in the European Union since crisis, since the beginning of the coronavirus crisis. So the 3% of Germans think the crisis shows that the European Union integration has gone too far. As Pro-Rector for International Affairs at the University of Bonn, I would like to thank you very much for this initiative today. And not only in view of the aforementioned survey, which is alarming. And I would like to say that already the composition of the organizers' team from Leiden, the Institut Francais des Pays-Bas, the Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom, and the Center for Advanced Security, Strategic, and Integration Studies, CASIS, at our university at Bonn, is convincing as a project based on partnership. As equal partners, you can join together in this European strategic dialogue and bring together diplomats, policymakers, academics, and civil society representatives to analyze and discuss core topics at the heart of the future of European security and defense. Only together can the question of how the Netherlands, France, and Germany can cooperate more closely on issues such as European security and defense be addressed. The dialogue series will start today. It's a kind of kickoff meeting today around table on the European Union strategic compass process. And many of you know um, that it is a process ongoing in which the union is engaged and whose results are supposed to be announced in the near future in February or March, 2022. You are creating an important platform for the public and for me, very important as well, for our students and the students from Leiden as well and from many other places. And the digital format allows us to uh, gain a large audience. And I think this is also very important. With your initiative, we hope to promote dialogue, but also to reduce uncertainty and fears. And it is precisely the public presentation of European strategies with regard to current challenges in the field of foreign and security policy that is a central task of the Interdisciplinary Research Center CASIS. Within the internationalization strategy of the rectorate, so you can see in my back on the picture, um, both countries, the Netherlands and France, have central positions in the era of our strategy. And I can say these are the first places uh, of all countries of the EU we are currently in the process of identifying new partner universities in both countries, a process that was started before the pandemic and will be intensified again in the coming year and uh, plans uh, are uh, in the making. This event will give new impetus to these initiatives and I thank you all for that as well. 
as an art historian, and you've heard that, uh, I worked uh, on uh, France and the Netherlands and the public sphere of art in the pre-modern era. And um, I analyzed the strong links between the three countries in the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries. As a member of the management of the CERC, the Centre Ernst Robert Curtius, it is all the more a pleasure for me to see our important EU partners together in the event series at one table with our university. I wish you all much success and look forward to intensifying our relations. I can say that on the part of the rectorate, we would like to express our utmost support for this. Good luck, bonne chance, and viel Glück. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Flor Münch, for your welcoming remarks and, and for also for your strong compliments for our kickoff event and our series. Thank you. Um, before we start our discussion now, I would like to announce that the second edition of our European Strategic Dialogue is already scheduled. It will take place on the 15th of December this year, and the series will then content, continue in 2022. And of course, we will inform you for the, on the upcoming issues in time. So just keep updated with one of our organizations and you'll surely receive an invitation. Um, so now again, on behalf of all partnering organizations, I wish everybody an interesting evening. And now I hand over to our moderator, Sophie Veritier, who will lead us uh, through tonight's discussion. Uh, Madame Veritier is a doctoral researcher at the Institute of Security and Global Affairs at Leiden University. Good evening, Sophie. Good evening. Thank you, Iris. Thank you so much. Um, I am delighted to welcome our speakers tonight, as well as the audience for the launch of the European Strategic Dialogue Lecture Series. I am extremely grateful for our partners at the French Embassy, the Friedrich Naumann Foundation, the University of Bonn, and Leiden University for making this exchange possible. For this first edition, we will concentrate on a hot topic of discussion, namely strategic autonomy. And more specifically, we will concentrate on the strategy compass. The strategy compass is the latest push from the EU to achieve greater ambitions in the field of security and defense. It was introduced during the German presidency of the Council in 2020 with the objective of laying the foundation for a common strategic culture in the EU. And as mentioned by Ambassador Vassi, it should be adopted in 2022 under the French presidency. More than a document, the strategic compass is a process structured in three steps. First, a threat analysis. Second, a structured dialogue. And third, a development phase leading to its adoption. And this refers to the move towards a more dynamic approach to relations in Europe that Ambassador Vassi was referring to earlier. Currently, we are in the last phase of this process because the HRVP is expected to present a first draft of the compass in the upcoming weeks. In, uh, in contrast to the previous attempt of the sort, the EU Global Strategy of 2016, the process of the strategy compass has been led by member states, not EU institutions. This has generated great hope to finally shed light on the EU's objectives in the field of security and defense, as well as ensure member states' commitment to such goals. Whether the strategic compass will prove successful or remain a paper exercise is still to be determined. So to provide more clarity on this question and many more from the audience, please let me introduce the exceptional panel of speakers we have reunited today. First, we are honored to have Ambassador Brengelman with us tonight. Before being appointed ambassador to the Netherlands in 2016, Ambassador Brengelman served as special representative for cyber foreign policy at the Federal Foreign Office, and then as Germany's ambassador to Brazil. He was previously, previously NATO's assistant secretary general for political affairs and security policy, where he advised the secretary general on political issues including NATO's partnership relations and interactions with other international organizations. We also have the pleasure to welcome Evelyne Grenech, who has been working at the French Ministry of the Armed Forces within the EU Department of the Directorate General 
for International Relations and Strategy, where she oversees the elaboration of ministerial positions on European defense issues. Previously, she worked in think tanks, research institutes, and the Legal Affairs Directorate of the French Ministry of the Armed Forces, where she was in charge of international agreements negotiated in the European and space areas. Evelyn, Evelyn was experiencing some technical issues, so hopefully right now she can hear us and, and speak. And last but not least, we have Joachim Koops with us this evening. Professor Koops is Chair of Security Studies and Scientific Director of the Institute of Security and Global Affairs at Leiden University's campus in The Hague. His research focuses on global security governance and the European Union's foreign and security policies, the role of international organizations in peace and security, and the changing nature of diplomacy. I will invite our audience to give a virtual round of applause for our speakers, who will each give a short statement before we open the floor for questions from the public. Please type your questions in the chat function. You can already do so now. Make sure to briefly introduce yourself if you wish to and indicate whether your question is addressed to the panel as a whole or to a specific speaker. You may also bring the discussion on Twitter with the hashtag European Strategic Dialogue. Ambassador Brengelman, welcome and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, before going into the issue, I need to add one thing to your introduction. I'm now the uh, senior fellow at CASIS at the University in Bonn and no longer the ambassador to the Netherlands. Uh, so I'm working now with CASIS in Bonn and uh, I was trying to give a translation to senior fellow and in German, the only one which I found was or Alta Knabe. So I think uh, the English word is actually much better. I'm very glad uh, that we had the opening with uh, Professor Munch and my former colleague in The Hague, Netherlands, Louis Vassy. Uh, it was always a pleasure working with you, Louis. I'm also very glad, I have to say that, that we were able to pull off this uh, cooperation together here, the French Institute, uh, the Leiden University, and our two German institutions. I think this is a very promising start, and I was already very much in favor of that working in The Hague. To the issue, what we already have heard from Louis Vassy, uh, what we are discussing when it comes to the strategic compass is very much about the issue of which role does Europe want to play, does the European Union want to play in future when it comes to the big international issues and in particular also when it comes to foreign and security policy. And um, it's true that we are living in a pretty competitive world, Ursula von der Leyen used the expression in a hyper-competitive world. We have uh, China, we have the US and others. We need to find questions about our own role. And I think we have now realized uh, that we need to take that debate more serious, uh, perhaps than we did some years ago. You could see that with recent proposals by the high representative, but also by others. And if if we didn't know it yet, uh, the situation in Afghanistan once again had shown to us that we need to be able to do more also when it comes to Europe being able to do something on its own feet. Having been in the Netherlands, I realized, and uh, Louis Vassy was referring to the rhetorical issues there, that talking about European sovereignty, talking about European autonomy does have different reactions when you talk to people. So I'm hopeful that the strategic compass will make us, uh, will make it possible to put these things on a more sober and uh, factual footing. And it is still, to be honest, a little bit early to, to see what exactly will come out of it. Uh, I, as I just said, I think we take it more serious, but at the same time, public debate does show us that there's a remaining level of ambiguity when it comes to the objectives and the capabilities, and actually the question of whether or not, and in which case you want to use these capabilities. 
And we need to make sure that we have the necessary buy-in of our member states. And as you, Sophie, just said, this time it's the member states who do the process. So the buy-in may perhaps be easier. And last not least, in the end of the day, much of it depends on the political will. And when I say political will, uh, people can imagine I also have my own country in mind, very much so. As we are now engaging in this debate about the strategic compass, looking at issues like crisis management and defense capabilities, also at the issue of resilience, an important piece and parcel of the debate nowadays, and partners, we need to realize that uh, at the other side of Brussels, in NATO headquarters, they are looking at a new strategic concept. So we are having that debate more or less in parallel. Uh, at the NATO side, the three core tasks so far have been collective defense, crisis management, and collective security. So the issues were a little bit uh, like the ones I have now mentioned for the strategic compass. Uh, but again, in NATO, they also will see whether they need to adapt that. When I worked at NATO, uh, it was during the period when we had the Libya situation. And I will never forget that in the beginning, some of us in Europe thought uh, we could do much of that on our own and then realized we needed the Americans for what we call the enablers uh, for very important military capabilities. That is many years ago. And as I said, Afghanistan has shown us once again that uh, we would depend on, on the support of the Americans in, in many situations. So when it comes to our own role, we have seen proposals from, uh, in the past, President Macron. We have seen more recently proposals uh, by the high representative. We have seen some uh, proposals by the German Minister of Defense, Annegret Kramp-Karrenbauer. And the level of ambition here is still somewhat different, but I think uh, it shows, uh, as I said before, that we need to be able to move forward this time now. And I think Germany and France together, obviously, but also very much so the Netherlands will be called upon to play a leading role in that debate. I've seen in the past more cooperation also on the level of the three working together. I will refer to the Indo-Pacific uh, policy of the European Union, where these three countries work very much together. And I think here also on the strategic compass, there's very much scope for the three of us working together. Uh, Louis Bassi has referred to different interests by different players in that. And again, same there at NATO, I think, especially our allies and partners in the East have a very clear strategic focus on security vis-a-vis -vis Russia. I think for member states in the South, uh, the Mediterranean is uh, somewhat more important. Our Anglo-American friends uh, are looking more to the Pacific uh, from time to time, and the issue of China comes, us, comes up. And I think we, we need to make sure that we bring all these interests together, but remain focused on our interests, European interests. Uh, so in that sense, uh, perhaps uh, we shouldn't go too much uh, far away, so to say. Here in Germany, as everybody knows, we now are engaged in, in coalition talks, like in the Netherlands. And uh, like in the Netherlands, not much has come out about these talks in the public domain. But recently, you can understand that the foreign and security policy issues do play a bigger role than perhaps uh, we had uh, seen in the past uh, weeks. Uh, there were some comments in the papers uh, very recently that the nuclear issue could play a, a, more, a more difficult uh, role in those coalition talks, the budget issue, uh, but also the question, how do we relate as Germans, as Europeans, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, autocratic governments, mind you very much in the center of that debate, our relationship with China and Russia. So we haven't seen the end of that debate yet. Uh, and uh, so in that sense, I can't tell you what the blueprint of that new government, uh, the, as we say in German, Ampel coalition will be. 
But uh, I think uh, foreign security policy does play a bigger role. And, and also that will have an important impact on what kind of contribution and input Germany will make in that debate on the strategic compass. This will also depend a little bit on what kind of understanding the three coalition partners will find here in Germany. But I don't expect too much deviation from what we have seen so far. Uh, and uh, because, for example, the SPD was part of the government, the foreign minister was from the SPD, and uh, Olaf Scholz was a member of the government. It is well known that the Greens and the Liberals uh, have a little bit more focus on uh, being somewhat more uh, critical when it comes to human rights with authoritarian governments. So I hope that the strategic compass will give us more clarity on the future of the European role in world affairs. And uh, I think this time we, we really need to make sure that we meet the rendezvous which we have promised ourselves. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And thank you for clarifying that indeed you are the former ambassador and, and now working at Cassis, of course. Um, very interesting words on this change of power dynamics. And I think the change of leadership in, in Germany probably is something that will um, come up in the questions as to what it will mean for, for the direction of the strategic compass. Um, Joachim, um, would you like to say a few words? Sure, thanks very much. Um, and of course, like everyone else, very excited um, to be here and thank you to everyone for making this happen and for, of course, the audience for attending at this uh, late hour. Um, so if we look um, a little bit at, at the entire issue at stake here, so, you know, the, the strategic compass, the move towards more uh, investment in security defense and the issue of how Europeans can, can finally make uh, some leapfrogging moves on, on pushing really their own capacities. Also, of course, in the wake of Afghanistan, those of you who have followed closely security and defense issues of uh, the EU, NATO, or transatlantic relations might think, well, what's new, uh, what's not, and, and so what? Uh, you can go all the way back to 1963 and Kennedy's uh, speech to the National Security Council, where essentially he said, we would no longer want to pay now for, uh, the, for European defense. The Europeans really have to, and NATO members have to stand on their own feet um and and uh, we also at the same time don't want to lose our influence over european security and economic affairs so it's, it's a 60-year tradition in a sense on the other side of the transatlantic uh, relationship in terms of the tensions between the us on the one hand really wanting europe to step up in terms of investments in terms of of uh, a more bang for a buck in security and defense but on the other hand also of course to maintain some kind of um, influence. And I think the Biden administration is in that tradition uh, a bit more vocal on, well, anything that is good for uh, strengthening NATO and the EU's defense base is also good for the US. We're going to focus all our strategic priorities now more on the Indo-Pacific. Um, but at the same time, I think this discussion uh, at, at, let's say, sub level or, or, or um, uh, administrative levels, uh, secretariat to secretariat discussions still has these tensions. The second tension in this entire debate, and that is how the EU and European member states and also NATO allies, um, and as I forget, there's almost an overlap of 75% uh, between EU and NATO in terms of member states. So anything that member states do in the EU will also inevitably affect uh, what happens in NATO and vice versa. So I think this debate of strategic autonomy playing off the EU versus NATO is in many ways a little bit of a false fear or false argument because at the member state level, um, you know, uh, the overlap is quite, quite high. But on the one hand, you have a pragmatic approach, a small scale approach where maybe two, three, four countries together really advance um, cooperation in a pragmatic way with real outcomes. Um, in PESCO, Permanent Structured Corporation since 2017, I'll come back to this in a second, uh, 46 different projects right now. And I think uh, PESCO um, requires also in this discussion a closer look, what worked, what didn't work. You know, these projects range from cyber security capacities to uh, military mobility, um, a defense base, uh, a training and so on and so forth. Um, and you have, 
a country that um, presides or coordinates each project. And just looking at that, by the way, and why the discussion of the Netherlands, Germany, and France is so important in that context of bilateral, trilateral approaches to pushing European security. Um, I just checked who is coordinating what, and 19 out of the 46 PESCO projects are actually run or coordinated by either Germany, France, or the Netherlands. Of course, with France uh, uh, being in the lead here, followed by Germany and the Netherlands. But that's 41% uh, of all these PESCO projects by these three countries. So if we look at wanting to advance European security and defense concretely on the ground and in, in, in advancing capacities, I think looking at PESCO and making sure that this yields results is important. But that's the one approach. This is the kind of pragmatic approach. But on the other hand, you really, and that's a strategic discussion, you really want to have coherence and you want to have comprehensiveness at the EU or NATO level. Um, somehow all these different initiatives have to collectively really move the European Union forward in its capacities, but also in the question or the answer to the question that uh, Ambassador Vasib uh, uh, posed, um, what for? So what's the objective? What are the strategic aims really for which you want to deploy all these capacities that should be um, developed? And there, I think in the last 20 years, we're not short of debates, papers, uh, strategies, the European Global Strategy published in 2016. Some people argue that rather than having now a new concept like the strategic compass, we should just revisit the global strategy and see what has been implemented there. Um, but I think the global strategy, while it's, it's still a good document, didn't answer really the question of the military strategy that the EU uh, should be um, developing. So the tension is between moving things forward rather than just always con concentrating on big papers and big summits and words, but being concrete uh, in terms of kind of uh, embodied by PESCO. And the other aim, having an overarching theme and strategy are, are those two approaches where a middle way um, has to be uh, found. Unifying 27 member states' strategic cultures is impossible. So I think there's a lot of writing and a lot of work being tried uh, uh, about this. It will never be possible to unite all these different strategic objectives. Geography also dictates different interests and different priorities. We've already touched on that. You know, the Russian threat is seen completely through different lenses by uh, different member states. So, so it's, it's almost uh, investing into something that is impossible. What can be achieved is though, to make, make sure that there is a coordination or harmonization of the different um, clusters and you know, Nordic cluster of cooperation, the Central Eastern cluster, Southern and so on and so forth. And again, Germany and France plays an important role. And so does the Netherlands, even though the Netherlands has traditionally been rather uh, at the sidelines of European security and defense, it was much more transatlantically oriented. But I think the, the outgoing Rutte government has made also some noise that it sees itself as the heir, the heir to, uh, to the UK, to be a balancer. On the one hand, transatlantic investment, but also uh, hopefully, at least rhetorically, we have some signs investing more in European security um, and, and, and defense. Now we see also, if you look at these three countries, uh, lots of reason for hope. Um, for example, Belgium and the Netherlands have been quite uh, strong in integrating their maritime forces, naval forces. Germany and the Netherlands have integrated, for example, uh, their tank forces. There is a Dutch-German core in Münster. There's a German-French core. So again, you have these bilateral elements. The key thing is to bring those together and, and maybe also sometimes connect bilateral with trilateral or multilateral uh, initiatives. And I think that's something that an overarching coordination approach should maybe achieve a bit more. Um, and then finally, we always have keywords. I agree, you know, semantics matter, also sometimes red, rag key phrases matter. The, the idea of a European army, even though it was called rapid reaction force, again, those of you who dealt with European security and defense will, of course, be reminded that this is a discussion that has also been going on for 25 years. The battle groups, uh, uh, which is this compromise of uh, up to five countries cooperating um, to at least put 1,500 troops together to react to crises outside Europe, um, have never been deployed. But if you look at the advances of interoperability, of common training and 
cultures and understandings between the participating countries, you see also some advances. So sometimes you have uh, maybe not the, the stated goal of the instrument in European security and defense, uh, like a battle group that will be deployed, um, but you might have secondary advances uh, and pragmatic uh, movements towards at least interoperability and strategic consensus and learning um, between groups of five or less um, states. And then finally, the strategic compass, of course, is not only about 27 member states, it's also about EU-NATO cooperation. Uh, Ambassador Brengelmann mentioned this. Um, of course, there might be a new strategic concept pretty soon from NATO. At the same time, uh, there is discussion of maybe having a new EU-NATO declaration. Um, there are uh, currently also uh, 75 different priorities and projects between the EU and NATO planned on security and defense. This is huge. So if you take 46 PESCO projects in the EU, 75 EU NATO projects, a lot is going on underneath the surface in terms of cooperation and joint projects. Um, also, PESCO is being opened to the US, uh, Canada, and Norway. That is an interesting development in terms of transatlantic cooperation. Um, and uh, uh, what is needed really, and in all three countries, the Netherlands, Germany and France, of course, yeah, new governments are uh, soonish uh, um, being installed. Uh, installing uh, the, the key thing is also the commitment at the national um, level. So I would leave it here um, and yeah, simply end with, with this key takeaway that um, we're not short of strategic papers and strategic discussions. We have enough strategies on the table. There's a lot of stuff going on underneath the surface in terms of cooperation, bringing it somehow together, I think would be already a, uh, in terms of coordinating these initiatives to a certain extent um, would already be a big step. Thank you very much, Professor Koops. Indeed, I think that's something that comes up quite often. We already have what is necessary to really have to study strategic autonomy. The, the question and the issue is to bring it together. Um, a very good comprehensive pictures and as well, very important emphasis on transatlantic relations. I will try and see if Evelyn can join us now to say a few words, otherwise we will jump straight into the question and answers. Right, I think Evelyn is still experiencing technical issues. Hopefully she can join us to say a few words before the end. Evelyn, can you, can you hear us? No. Okay. Ah. Hi. <laughs> Sorry. Really? Can you? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay. <laughs> Good. I'm very. I apologize for these uh, difficulties. I have uh, many problems on Zoom. So, but thank you very much for your invitation uh, and for this initiative too. Uh, it is very useful uh, to have this kind of discussion. Uh, especially on the strategic compass. So uh, I am very pleased to be here with you today to discuss the, these um, issues. Um, as it has been well underlined before, as you know, the international context uh, has uh, deteriorated in recent years. Uh, while a certain number of threats are still relevant, like jihadist terrorism, the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, the intensification of strategic and military competition, but other uh, threats have become more pronounced, uh, like the development and generalization of hybrid strategies or the deconstruction of the security architecture uh, inherited from the Cold War, etc. So, um, in the, this context, uh, France actualized in January its national strategic review on security and defense, uh, where European sovereignty has a very crucial role. Uh, since then, as you all know, uh, European uh, needs uh, also to learn from the US withdrawal from Afghanistan and the announcement of the AUKUS uh, partnership. So uh, for us, uh, this event showed that the security and defense of Europeans is primarily uh, a matter of our 
uh, the European Center. Um, in this context, uh, for France, the EU must continue to strengthen its ability to act by developing its strategic autonomy in order to maintain its freedom of action. And uh, I want to underline here that for France, acquiring this autonomy does not mean turning back on our allies, including the United States. And, um, on the contrary, it means becoming a more credible strategic partner, better equipped, and better able to assume global responsibilities for a better better journey, as it has been underlined before. It also means ensure a healthier and more balanced uh, transatlantic relationship in the future. Um, so the work undertaken since, the two, since 2017 to strengthen European strategic autonomy must therefore continue. We must, uh, we must go uh, ahead. And I want here to underline that at the EU level, unexpected progress has been done in recent years at different levels regarding the enhancing and strengthening of European defense. At the capacity level of the operational field, uh, for example, in the capacity level, the Permanent Structural Cooperation, PESCO, has been activated in 2017 with 25 member states. And as it has been also underlined before, there is 46 projects uh, at, at this stage. And uh, all uh, there is um, capability uh, and technical uh, projects, as well as operational pro projects. And the fourth wave of projects will soon be adopted. Uh, there is also the European Defence Fund, um, who, uh, which allows uh, the financing of research and development of structuring capability projects. This is a major turning point for the first time European funding is allocated to the defense industry. It is a major finance, financial sorry, le, um, lever with 8 billion for this period 2021 to 2027. This shows that the EU is concerned about its defense industrial base, which is the condition for our capacity, capacity, sorry, for joint action. Uh, as you know, there has also been uh, the relaunch of the European capability process with the establishment last year of the first coordinated annual review on defense, the CART, uh, that uh, identified areas where European cooperation is crucial in order to reduce our capability gap. Um, moreover, in the operational field, too, uh, we have strengthened our ability to act together with the rise of the military planning and conduct capability, MPCC, the C2, the creation uh, at the end of 2020 of the European Peace Facility, the EPS, which makes it possible to finance the equipment of partner forces and which begin to finance, to finance the first equipment supply project for our partners this year. The, uh, the reinforcement of the level of ambition of the European operational commitment, uh, for example, the rise in ambition of EUTM Mali or the creation of uh, IRINI operations. So as you can see, the progress make, uh, made in recent years has been rapid and concrete. But Europeans still have a long way to go on the, and the strategic compass should raise our ambition, particularly in order to avoid the EU becoming hostage to the rivalities of others. So this dynamic must continue by opening a new cycle for European defense. And this is the purpose of the strategic compact exercise, uh, exercise that is currently taking place in the EU. As the new strategic document, the strategic compass will give a new political impetus for European defense. It intends to provide clear orientation by 2030, whether in terms of crisis management, capability development, resilience, and partnerships. Thanks to, um, to the strong involvement of uh, the member states, discussions have already made significant progress. Uh, next week, uh, Defense and Foreign Minister will meet in Brussels 
to discuss the next as a text story and uh, provide guidance as the European Council in mid-December will also do. The text will also be discussed, uh, will discussed in the Political and Security Committee panel. And finally, the strategic compass should be adopted under, as it has been also uh, underlined before, uh, should be adopted under the French presidency of the European Council in the first half of 2022. So as you can see, uh, these next few months will be intense and decisive uh, for the future development of European defense. For France, which will take uh, over the EU Council presidency in January, the strategic compass should be the vehicle through which the EU takes a significant step toward European sovereignty in the field of security and defense. And in this perspective, we strive to promote this ambition vision for European defense. Because we think that to uh, ensure the security and defense of citizens, we must make the EU a global player capable of carrying more weight in strategic competition uh, by giving it uh, the means to act. So if you agree, I could, uh, I could discuss the different issue um, that uh, has been uh, uh, presented before on the EU NATO cooperation, on the capability, on the crisis management, or specifically uh, during the discussion. Perfect. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Evelyn. Great that you could finally join us. Um, and a great overview on the progress indeed that has been done and the important role of France in this process. And I'm sure that as an insider, you can um, also share your insights on how this process of the strategic compass has been going so far. Uh, we have already received very interesting questions from the audience. I will select the first one, um, which is very interesting. How do you push for strategic power when the EU is facing severe threats to the rule of law, which undermine the legitimacy and strategy of the EU as a power? So how are the internal turmoil, turmoils of the EU going to impact the development of the strategic compass? Um, perhaps Ambassador Brengelman, you can take the floor first, then I will give the floor to Evelyn if she has anything to add, and then to Professor Coops. Yes, thank you. And uh, indeed, that's a very good question because uh, what we need when we build up our own role in world affairs, so to say, is also to be a credible player. And challenges uh, to our rule of law is uh, important. Uh, uh, so th that is a very keen issue. But at the same time, whilst we were having these debates, uh, don't forget that we were able to increase our capabilities. And we have heard uh, uh, Professor Copes mentioning the projects which we have in PESCO and between NATO and the European Union, all of that we were able to develop. But still, I accept the point that it is important that we as a European Union are uh, also able to, to represent uh, a credible, if you like, a credible position. And uh, apart from this rule of law challenge, let me perhaps also add that there is this issue of coherence, internal and external. I, I recall um, challenges which uh, our partner uh, Lithuania had to undergo when they were a little bit uh, in, in opposition to some ideas which uh, China would have with them. Uh, so that was a difficult period for them. And we need to make sure that we, as an EU, are having some uh, internal Koreans. At the same time, it's remarkable and um, regrettable, actually, <laughs> that some of us um, would find it difficult to agree to statements of the European Union on uh, human rights, etc and would block statements by the high representative. I'm referring here obviously to Hungary. And there you do have a relationship with the other question. So yes, credibility is an important value. It's an important currency, as we say, in uh, world affairs. And, and therefore, I do agree, it is uh, posing a challenge to, 
to, to our possibilities. But at the same time, as I said, we are able to, to increase our capabilities. It's more on the political side. Thank you very much. Um, Evelyn, would you like to add something? Yes, I totally agree. Uh, in order to be credible, uh, I think that the, the strategic approach is also be a, um, a strategic document to improve the effectiveness uh, of the defense and security uh, of the Union and its member states. Uh, we have to define new actions and tools uh, with a timetable to enable the European Union to act more quickly and decisively uh, in the face of crisis. But we have also to act to protect our citizens, um, to stimulate investment, innovation, to develop the, necess the necessary capabilities and technologies. And uh, we also have, and the strategic compass will uh, discuss or, um, of course this issue, uh, we also have to deepen our cooperation uh, with partners. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Koops? Yeah, no, just very briefly, uh, and thanks um, and greetings to uh, to Lily. Great that she could join. Um, thanks for the question. So I think it's it's not only about um, rule of law issues that with, with known problems in Poland, Hungary, and so on and so forth. But you know, I think that can be an entire panel in itself, and should probably should be in the future on this uh, series, where we also see uh, other countries not being fantastic in terms of implementing um, rulings of the European Court of Justice and the rest of but the commissions also the three countries that are uh, the focus of this European strategic dialogue. Um, but it, we should also focus, I think, importantly, on uh, the human rights dimension of security and defense missions. Um, I'm particularly worried about the undermining of human rights focus or saving lives focuses of the um, naval operations. There's been a shift from, uh, by, uh, you know, outside, um, in cooperation with Libya, outside Libyan waters, a shift from humanitarian purposes uh, under the common security defense policy, rescuing lives to securitization. So uh, pushbacks, uh, um, relying on uh, yeah, malicious human rights abuses uh, and so forth. So that undermines, of course, the normative uh, and liberal power idea that, that, that you mentioned uh, in, your, in your question, Lily. So, so I think that's an important thing, and it also links to another important aspect, and that is the in international deployments, the protection of civilians. So a core aspect, for example, of United Nations peacekeeping, the EU has been trying a lot to support UN peacekeeping, if you think about Mali, but also now a new training mission in Mozambique, uh, where again, I think um, the focus also on human rights training and the prioritization of human rights and protection of civilians is something that really should be at the forefront. If uh, you know, and should not get lost in all these discussions about strategic autonomy, security, capabilities, and so on and so forth. So when we ask for, okay, what for, at the end of the day, if the European Union wants to remain a normative power, even though lots of people would probably uh, be skeptical that it ever has been, then that should be at the forefront um, of, of uh, CSDP. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, we already have another question that links to this. Um, internal differences. Um, someone is asking, um, where do you believe the threat assessments between France, Germany, and the Netherlands differs the strongest? And how will this be reflected in the strategic compass? So what are the differences, the main divergences that exist between the three core countries that we are mentioning today? Um, Evelyn, perhaps you would like to go first? Uh, yes, I, I, I don't see um, so much uh, gap between uh, between member states on the the threat uh, analysis. Um, France welcome uh, very well the the threat analysis that is quite complete uh, and underlines the fact that uh, there is a risk uh, that Europe will be um, uh, overtaken by its uh, competitors, and I think we all agree. Uh, I guess <laughs> uh, on that and um, in the threat analysis also it's global um, uh, there is a global approach uh, and uh, we think that uh, this is the right uh, manner to, to do 
and um, regional crises and conflicts, emerging threats and challenges, uh, such as um, hybrid uh, tactics, uh, strategic use of emerging technologies, competition uh, in contextual strategic spaces, uh, climate change, etc., address it. So um, I think this uh, overview of uh, of threats um, is um, I, uh, found make um, a sort of consensus um, between the member states. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Ambassador Bregelman, do you have a different perception of the question? If I understood the question correctly, you asked whether I would see some stark differences between the three of us. There I don't see too many stark differences. As I said in the beginning, I think some of our colleagues in the East would probably highlight more the security vis-a-vis -vis Russia than, than others would, uh, but that is uh, it, it's pretty understandable given their geographical situation. Um, I think, uh, however, uh, Joachim Kolbs made an important point just a moment ago. The threat analysis and all of that, I think there is not too much difference between us. But when it comes to point which uh, Joachim Kops mentioned, the, the issue of human rights and uh, common foreign and security policy and what we see now when it comes to the issue of migration, there you find differences between member states, but perhaps even more difficult also differences between our political systems back home, be it in Germany, be it in the Netherlands, be it in, in, uh, in France. Uh, and, and the risk here is that this constant failure of, uh, of uh, all of us, so to say, to, to come to a conclusion on the migration debate undermines, again, I'm coming to the point of credibility, undermines the credibility of what we are doing. This is more indirect. Uh, when it comes to the threat analysis, I think these three countries are pretty much in line with each other. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Koops, any last words to add on this question? Yeah, I don't, I don't think the issue is different threat assessments between the three countries. I think it's more the response. Mm -hmm. So what are the right tools? What are the right uh, answers to different threats? And there, I think we see more and more convergence as well. But I think, as everyone knows, on European security issues, uh, the use of force, military force for solving um, variety of threats is simply a dividing divisive issue. Uh, France is much more uh, proactive when it uh, comes to the use of military force. Germany traditionally is uh, far more reluctant to deploy military force. I mean, in the population, there is slowly, slowly more acceptance, uh, but it's still very much, um, let's say, um, uh, cautious to deploy the military. So I think the difference is more on the response rather than the assessment of the threat and how it should be reflected in the strategic compass. Well, I think the entire exercise of the strategic compass, like any EU document, will always try to link the commonalities uh, and the common denominators and not so much the differences. Sophie, can I add to that? Of course, go ahead. Because I think Joachim Kops made a very valid point, uh, and I think I referred to it in the beginning indirectly when I said using all these capabilities in the end then is an issue of political will. And I said, and I'm referring mostly to my own country on that point. And you, you may remember in 2014 at the Munich Security Conference, there was quite a heavy debate between the political elite of Germany, whether or not we needed to make more of an effort in, in our own uh, security policy. I think the elite understood the challenge, but uh, I also agree with Joachim Kops uh, to have the German population, so to say, to have their buy-in is still a bit of an uphill battle. We are making progress, but I can tell you when I do my pub test, which is talking to friends in a local pub, uh, I still get this, why should we? And uh, uh, would the others really want us to do that? And uh, there's still some... Uh, some some uh, argumentation necessary. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, indeed, I agree. The the differences might be mostly in the responses form, and that leads to the next question from our audience from uh, Jules, who is tutor in security studies at ISCA, 
who is asking if France, Germany, and the Netherlands see eye to eye when it comes to transatlantic relations and EU NATO cooperations. And I wonder specifically if uh, the AUKUS Pact and the consequences that it that it has specifically affected France's perception on that. So Evelyn, perhaps you could say a few words about this. Um, I think I can start if you want to. Or... Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, for France, um, the UN NATO partnership is fundamental for taking global challenges. Um, to, because, uh, as we say in the introduction, current and emerging strategic challenges are increasingly uh, hybrid and dual, civil and military. So, as a result, they include areas uh, in which the EU has long since uh, begun to develop expertise. Um, so, we, uh, we think that this exercise could be of a great use to NATO. Uh, and I think uh, here there is, um, uh, we, on, on this um, picture, we, we agree, I think. <laughs> um, besides um, two European uh, defense initiatives, uh, we tend to uh, contribute to a bit of a sharing with NATO and to the overall, overall sorry, um, security of the transatlantic uh, area. Um, so, um, we must to promote uh, a more um, a more developed uh, transatlantic relationship, especially with NATO and uh, and uh, the strategic compact um, on, on, on the partnership basket um, should uh, help to, to define uh, ways and uh, areas uh, where we can improve this uh, cooperation. Thank you very much. Um, Professor Goops, what is your take on this question? Um, so I think a textbook answer is that there is always this very fine division, right? Uh, France obviously pushing for autonomy, making sure that the European base, the European, you know, through the European Union uh, is very strong in security defense. Uh, every now and then, I mean, the history of European security and defense and integration is the history also of very often tensions between uh, France and the US, but the always uh, a bit like a rubber band uh, move the further they move the, the quicker they also get together again after crisis after crisis and that um, and that the Netherlands are of course very NATO oriented right Atlantic and Germany is somewhere in between I think that textbook view is shifting uh, it's been very clear since the return of France to NATO's integrated structures that there is a much more strategic thinking also about strengthening NATO that it is not a zero-sum game between NATO and the EU um, and at the same time, also, there is uh, a clear understanding also within Germany, uh, Germany leads that um, neither of the two organizations should be played off against each other. About the Netherlands, I, uh, as I mentioned before, I think it's been a very staunch and strong transatlantic player, a very strong contributor also to ISAF and hence also a very strong weight, uh, where the role of uh, European security and defense integration has always been been a bit absent from political prioritization, even though the public um, has been more and more supportive of stronger action in, in European uh, security affairs. So this is slowly, slowly changing, but um, I think also just recent reviews that were initiated by a variety of think tanks uh, in the Netherlands still show that um, when it comes to Dutch strategic thinking about the EU, there is still quite a gap and I think far more can be done. Thank you. Ambassador Brangelman, would you like to add something to this? Thank you, yeah, that, that's very much something which uh, covered my diplomatic life for 20 or 30 years. Um, when I started working on security issues it was actually on the European side. I was the German officer at the Western European Union and co-author of the so-called Petersberg Declaration. And at that time, when we tried to do more for European security, we were all run, always running the risk to have a major banging on our head from our Atlantic partners. Also, at that time, the capabilities on the European side were pretty limited. From 2010 till 2013, I was actually working on NATO-EU cooperation in NATO as political director of NATO. 
And it was still difficult to come together, to start projects together, because there were political limitations to that. So we managed to do more. But now, as uh, Joachim Kolb said a moment ago, now it has been really gross business. Uh, and there are a lot of common projects. And why so? Because now, nowadays, NATO does take the European Union security policy much more serious than it ever did. There is no more really banging the Europeans uh, over when when they do a little more there. There's sometimes concerns, but it's different from from uh, some time ago. So now this is gross business. And I would agree with uh, Joachim Kolbs that this kind of usual description of where we are is shifting, but also yeah, in the past it has to be. It was like this. And uh, Germany was a little bit, as we say in German, so wohl als auch, uh, both issues together, transatlantic and European at the same time. That was very much our tradition and our reflex, so to say, whereas uh, the Dutch perhaps more on the NATO side and the French perhaps more on the European side. The AUKUS thing, uh, yeah, it did play a role. I mentioned a moment ago, Afghanistan showed us that the, we Europeans on certain moments depend a lot on the Americans, but it was also another issue, the issue of trust and confidence, because our American allies had told us that they would do together in, together out, and, and we know it wasn't uh, clear cut uh, according to the textbook in the end. So that did create a certain uh, problem for trust and confidence. And here the AUKUS thing, which came, so to say, overnight, and uh, I, I, I think also left a little bit that impression that uh, consulting with allies was not always uh, in the order of the day. So in that sense, it was a bit of a political issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting indeed. Um, we have another question that I was personally wondering about. What, it, what do you think will be the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the development of this strategic compass? And not only in terms of um, health issues and pandemic management in the future as a security issue, but also more broadly concerning the integration of human security in security and defense, and this also important concept of resilience. So what are the lessons learned for the strategic compass? Um, Professor Koops, would you like to go first? Yeah, I mean, just very briefly, and I think the uh, topic of health security uh, is now really at the forefront. It was a niche topic uh, just a couple of years ago, and now I think as a result of the pandemic, it's at everyone's mind uh, in terms of non-traditional threats. And also, uh, I think NATO will also concern itself with it. Yeah, hasn't been the best hour of glory for European coordination uh, and integrated responses for a variety of reasons, some of them longstanding, the usual um, uh, weak, weak points of European coordination when it comes to national security, national threats, of course, governments have to show that they act fast, that they, uh, um, they're they responsive to the needs of their own citizens, and that always comes at the cost of coordination and, uh, and, and a cool head thought through coordinated approach. The uh, commission made some mistakes itself, but also um, well, had, had no chance, even if it had made, hadn't made its uh, mistakes in terms of being uh, take accepted as the lead player in this. So um, this had issues for the response and credibility and effectiveness of the EU internally, but also again, COVID uh, and, and health security or mask diplomacy, however you want to call it, had a huge external ramification as well. I mean, the entire geopolitical competition played out uh, on the back of COVID as well, where you know China, for example, uh, and, and Russia, um, uh, try to supply, um, you know, medical equipment and so on and so forth to, you know, if you think about the Balkans, uh, to also undermine and show that uh, it's not the European Union that can take care of citizens also in aspiring EU countries. So a lot of issues, I think, to work through, um, ancillary issues also, how COVID-19 and disinformation campaigns, I mean, so for you working on that, uh, has also um, uh, heightened the threat and the EU and NATO have to find some kind of responses. It's interesting to see that in the context of the strategic compass conversations, uh, that is one topic where also um, synergies 
can be seen and to be explored between NATO and the EU when it's about you know battling uh, disinformation issues, uh, resilience, and so on and so forth. So, yeah, very very. I want to say mixed picture, but not really a mixed picture. Pretty clear that uh, we've, we've not proven ourselves to be very effective as Europeans in responding in an adequate way to this. And and I hope that this also, of course, um, influences uh, lessons learned and 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 um, responses uh, in, in the context of the strategic compact. Thank you very much, um, Evelyn. What is your perception on this question? Um, <clears throat> thank you. I think the, um, the pandemics um, show that uh, uh, the need to, to increase our resilience and, um, and the, all the effort um, have um, to, to do uh, in this uh, domain. Several proposals for action uh, could uh, be adopted uh, in terms of uh, resilience, uh, such as uh, not only um, in the domains of, uh, of health and, uh, and uh, pandemic stress, et cetera, but uh, more broadly, um, there, there, really, there, there is uh, a need uh, to strengthen the security of uh, institutional networks, uh, France also supports the proposal um, for uh, develop, uh, developing a hybrid toolbox uh, because uh, we, we also are facing uh, uh, to different uh, threats uh, in the cyber disinformation and uh, all these kinds of, uh, of things that, uh, that um, are challenging the, the European Union. And uh, the challenge uh, posed, uh, posed by um, also, I think, to, uh, to the problematic of lawfare uh, must, uh, must also be taken into account. So uh, the pandemic, um, so we faced uh, not really um, uh, had an impact on the, on the exercise of the strategic compass, but uh, we, I think we are more um, conscious of uh, all these issues. Thank you very much. Um, Ambassador Bregelman, I'll leave the last words on this for you. You're still muted. Okay. Yeah. Now we can hear you. Okay, thank you. I, I was lost for a moment. I think indeed, as Johan Gob said, uh, we didn't uh, perform that well. But uh, on the other hand, I think that the first impression which uh, the Chinese and the Russian uh, deliveries of vaccines, etc., have made a little bit more in doubt these days than they were in the beginning. We also failed a little bit to make sure that everybody understood how much we actually do for COVAX and bilaterally for others. Uh, so we do more than perhaps meets the eye, but in the end, not enough overall, as became very clear in Glasgow and before at the, the G20. For our debate here, I think it has been important. It, it has been important in the sense that we realize we need to be able to rely a little bit more on ourselves and make sure that uh, supply chains, etc., are done in a way that uh, on very critical issues like uh, vaccines, et cetera, we can do more ourselves, uh, resilience. And so it has increased our thinking in that regard, notwithstanding the doubts which we had developed. So yes, to use the term by, uh, by Johan Gobes, a mixed picture, but I'm, I'm taking the more hopeful approach here that it has uh, actually given us a push to think in the right direction, hopeful. Thank you. Thank you so much. I will just ask one last fire question before concluding with some, with some remarks uh, from, from Anselm who asked, in which issue could every single of the 27 member states be fully motiv to, motivated to feel European when it comes to the strategic compass? If you could answer this question in just a few words, what would it be? To whom are you asking? Whoever wants to go first. <laughs> <laughs> Difficult. 
<laughs> to find one thing which all 27 could uh, link up to, to yeah. make sure that we, Europe, are seen as, as a global player and not just uh, minions. I think that's something everybody understands. Okay. That's my belief. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Cooks, what's your what's your take on this? Yeah, I mean, everything that exists and has been achieved eh, in security and defense is, of course, carried by all member states. And that is the common security and defense policy that is the European Defense Agency and investments. Uh, and again, as I mentioned before, the different uh, initiatives at, at bilateral, trilateral level. So I think everyone agrees that, and that's, again, eh, if we only think uh, 25 years uh, ago, that's not something to be taken for granted. The fact that the EU is seriously investing in, or member states are investing in, uh, in security and defense uh, was unthinkable only, only um, uh, 25 years ago. Um, and that's an, despite all the difficulties and all the things still to go, an incredible achievement. Indeed, indeed. And Evelyn, some last few words on this? But the question is, if, uh, if we have one thing to, I, 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 sorry, I, I think I didn't get very well the question. No problem, I will repeat it. Um, someone from the audience asked, in which issue could every single member state be fully motivated to feel fully European? So something that really every member state agree on. One thing that every member state uh, agrees on. Mm -hmm. To be included in the strategic compass. Um, uh, well, <laughs> that's a difficult. Uh question. Um, I, I think that, um, mm, yeah, the, um, the ambition and um, the fact that uh, we have uh, to, to act uh, and to develop uh, European defense. And uh, so, of course, we, we have uh, different visions and uh, and uh, see the actions um, in the different manner, but for, for the ambition and um, and uh, the threat analysis, uh, as uh, we talked just uh, before, uh, I think yes, we we could um, have uh, this uh, consensus in the strategic compass, perhaps. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Thank you so much. So just to summarize the discussion we just had, thank you so much for everyone for their question and thank you again for our speakers for their great answers and interventions. Um, a lot of progress has been done, but a lot remains as well to be done. Uh, the three key points that were mentioned in this discussion were first of all, the credibility of the EU as a global player and as a security player which will be determined by its unity and also its coherence and the way it manages internal divisions and internal issues. So it will be important for the EU to stand by its values in order to be taken seriously. And that also means protecting human rights, rule of law and civilians, whether that's in the EU or in missions abroad. The second theme that was mostly touched upon was the divergences and the convergences when it comes to security and defense. Um, everyone agreed that the similarities are much larger than, the, than the, the disagreements. And when it comes to common points, um, we have the ambition of the EU to become this global player and the existing initiatives and investment that already brings EU member states together. When it comes to differences, uh, migration was brought up, the rule of law and transatlantic relations, um, not so much, but could be um, um, a political uh, point of discussion. And finally, when it comes to uh, the development of security beyond traditional conventional warfare and integrating human security challenges such as resilience to disinformation and geopol geopolitical competition, uh, specifically in the EU's background um, and neighbors. Um, and with uh, on that, Ambassador uh, Brangelman made a great point about the EU needing to be better at communicating 
what it's already been uh, doing and what has been done and what uh, has been achieved. Um, so with this, I will close the discussion. Thank you once again very much for all your uh, inputs, virtual round of applause, <laughs> the way we do it on Zoom. Um, I don't know if there is a applause function here. Uh, we're used to Teams and, and Lighted, but for sure, I, I'm sure that everyone behind your screen is very grateful for this very stimulating exchange. And I hope that we will see each other again for the second edition of the European Strategic Dialogue, which will be on the 15th of December. Thank you so much and have a great evening. Many thanks, Sophie. Thank you.